I'm very blessed and excited about this that we're beginning today. As, uh, t this morning, I'm, I'm going to be covering the subject of God as he's communicated to us in the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. And then next week, we're going to cover what the, some of the things it talks about, about God in the prophets, and then the following week in the um, writings and so on. And we're going to just focus these next weeks on our glorious God. The reason for doing that is the more that we understand about God, the greater we comprehend him, the greater our relationship with him can be, and the greater our love for him that can develop. The more you know him, the more you're going to love him. And, uh, and some of these things, obviously, we've known and will be in a, a point of review, but it, what a wonderful review it is to focus upon who our God is. And the thing, the thing about God that uh, the more that you know him, the more that you experience him in your life, the more that you are inspired to give him praise and to glorify him. Like I, like I said uh, this morning, I'm going to focus primarily on the first five books of the Bible. We'll come terribly short of covering everything that is communicated about Yahweh in these first five books because they... It certainly lays the foundation of our understanding of Almighty God. But uh, I'm going to go to these verses in the New Testament to begin, and it will be the only time that I focus on the New Testament. But I, it says it so succinctly and so repeatedly, and this is kind of what's in our heart, is that if we know God better, if we're more God-centered and minded, then we'll do that which is appropriate, which is to glorify Him. These uh, verses in the New Testament are called di doxologies. Doxology means praise or giving glory to God. It says in Romans 16, 27, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, be glory forever. Amen. In Galatians 1, 5, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And then in Philippians 4.2, Now unto the God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And Timothy 1.17, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And then in 2 Timothy 4.18, the latter part, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then Hebrews 13.21, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Peter 4.11, through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. These verses communicate what should be the response of every human being, that is, to glorify this wonderful God that we worship, this God that is, is central to everything, the great reality of all of life is God. You know, I was thinking this morning that it's, it's, always, it's always a very humbling uh, experience for me to stand before anybody and to speak God's word, to do it one-on-one -on -one or to do it in a group. To ever have the privilege to speak God's word is very humbling. It's very honoring. It's just, it's beyond my comprehension that God would bless me to do such a thing. And, and I, I was also thinking that if, if every minute of my life, of every hour of my life, of every day of my life, every month, every year that I have lived, if, if the culmination of everything that God has given to me, if today, right now, I can help you to glorify God, all of that would have been worth it. My whole life existence, if just for this one period of time, this one moment in time, that I could inspire other people to give God what he is due, his glory, then it would be worth all of it, and then some. Because God deserves to be glorified. He really does. And in, in light of that, I thought it would be good to put before you what I'm going to share this morning 
obviously in brief, so that we could have this opportunity to glorify God. Yahweh is our God, and Yahweh is the Eternal One. Yahweh is the Creator. Yahweh is all-powerful, that is, omnipotent. Yahweh is the Most High God. Yahweh knows all that can be known. Yahweh is the just and righteous judge. Yahweh is everywhere present, omnipresent. Yahweh is holy. Yahweh keeps his covenants. He has integrity. And Yahweh is compassionate. He's gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, abounding in truth, forgiving and punishing those who are guilty. He is all of this and so much more. And what I'd like to do this morning, so that if I don't accomplish anything else in sharing with you, that we would take just a few minutes right now, all of us, to either focus on these things that I have here, or just close your eyes and give, give Yahweh thanks. Glorify Him. Praise Him. Thank Him. Focus on Him and give Him the glory that is due Him. We're going to begin in Genesis chapter 1, and uh, obviously the, uh, the appropriate place, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And I, I'd just like to put this in your mind as we begin this series of teachings, is that God is not who we want Him to be. He's not the God of your understanding. He is not the God that we want Him to be. Rather, He is who he says he is. And the scriptures make clear to us who he is. It's not only the scriptures that reveal to us God, his creation, his whole creation reveals to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear who God is. But God, God is who he is, not who we think he is. And, and God, you know, God is, not, is, the requirement of understanding God is not your acceptance of him. It doesn't matter if you accept him, if you believe in him, if you, uh, if you don't believe in him. He is who he is, and it is our quest to better understand just who this God is. It says in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Obviously, most significantly, he is God. And I, I guess the... Uh, in this first chapter of, of the Bible, the very first chapter, 32 times the word God is used. In the beginning, God, in verse 1. In verse 2, the Spirit of God. In verse 3, then God said. In verse 4, God saw. In verse 5, God called. In verse 6, God said. In verse 7, God made. In verse 8, God called. And, and so on it goes. There's 28 times that the word God is used in the first chapter of the book. And perhaps that's the most important reality for everyone to embrace. God is. God is. He is who He is. And we should, you know, there's a lot of people in the world, a lot of unfortunate people, who don't believe that God is. They, they call themselves atheists, or, and there's some that doubt whether or not he lives, and they call themselves agnostics. <laughs> Couldn't get that word out. Uh, so the, great, the greatest thing for us to realize, first and foremost, is God is. He is indeed. He exists. 
We're going to go, we're going to come back to this, but let's look at Genesis, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3 is the record where Moses was being commissioned by God to go to Egypt and to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt and then for him to go to the Israelite leaders and say, follow me, I'm going to lead you out of Egypt. And Moses, uh, in his communication with God, in verse 13 said to God, behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, I, I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The, the words I am, the derivative, they're a derivative from the Hebrew verb haya, H-A-Y-A-H. Which, mean, which means, its meaning is to be, to be. And it's wisely translated, I am. For the word denotes past, present, and future. I am. It's a very good translation of that Hebrew word. Who is, what is my name? My name is, I am. He was, he is, he will be. Uh, and then God said to Moses, I am who I am. In essence, he was saying, I am the existing one. I am the eternal one. I am the present one. I am the existing one. I am the eternal one. I am the present one. And it goes on into the next verse. It says in 14, and God said to Moses, or 15, God further said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, that word, the Lord, is one word, in Hebrew, it's the word Yahweh, and that is God's proper name. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name. What? Yahweh is God's name. Our God's name is Yahweh. There are other gods, but the true God that we worship and we follow and we glorify, His name is Yahweh. And Yahweh, in, in essence, means the eternal one, the present one, the one who was, the one who is, the one who is to come, the eternal one. In Exodus chapter 6, in verse 6, it says, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord. And the word again, Lord, is Yahweh. I am Yahweh. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with a great judgment. Then I will take you for my people. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of Egypt. I am Yahweh, your God. Look at chapter 8 of Exodus. Exodus chapter 8, in verse 10. Then he said, tomorrow, so he said, may it be according to your word, that you may know that there is no one like Yahweh, your God. Yahweh, your God. Verse 28, Pharaoh said to him, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice to Yahweh, your God. Chapter 10, very clearly written in the Torah is who our God is. He is Yahweh. He, Yahweh is our God. Chapter 10, verse 8, and Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh and said to them, Go serve Yahweh, your God. Verse 16. Then Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses and Aaron, and he said, I have sinned against Yahweh, your God. Verse 17. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin alone only, 
this cause and make supplication to Yahweh your God. This phrase, Yahweh your God, is written 283 times in the first five books of the Bible. 283 times we are told Yahweh is our God. And then the phrase, Yahweh, uh, the phrase Yahweh, your God, is the one that's written 283. And then Yahweh, our God, is written 28 times. So that we, we, have, we should understand clearly who our God is. For that matter, in the, in the first five books of the Bible, the word Yahweh is used 1,821 times. I think God wants us to understand who He is, that He is Yahweh. And then in the Old Testament, in the entirety of the Old Testament, it's written almost 7,000 times the word Yahweh. Yahweh is our God. Back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It says in Exodus 20:11, For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And in Exodus 31, 17, it is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever, for in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from his labor. And then um, the point is, however we understand this, reading in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, and then the other places that are presented in the Bible, God is the creator. Everything that exists is because of Him. Revelation 4.11 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they exist and were created. The God that we worship, Yahweh our God, is the creator of the heavens and the earth. However, however that is understood as far as time, is not really the issue. The issue is He's the Creator. There would be nothing if it weren't for Him. And because He is the one that brought everything into existence, He is deservant of our praise and our honor and our glory. Yahweh is all-powerful, is the next point that I wanted to bring to your attention. It sort of goes hand-in-hand with being the creator, the one that could put the stars in the sky, the innumerable stars in the sky, that the galaxies and galaxies and galaxies that we can't even count, the creator of all of that and the creator of you as a human being and everything therein is all powerful. The power that he has is truly beyond our human description or comprehension. He's the one that created all and we see in the time of the flood, he's the one that caused that flood to happen and to change the whole earth and everything in the earth and in the atmosphere to be the way it is today. And he's the one that when Christ comes back is going to change things again. He is all powerful. He is also, look at uh, chapter, Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. Verse 18, I'm just pointing out the things that are very obvious, the most obvious of all. This is in the time of Abraham when he fought against the kings that came to Sodom and Gomorrah and brought Lot and others captive, and he went and freed them. And he comes back, and it says in verse 18, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he, Melchizedek, was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, the God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed God the Most High, who, was, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. God is the Most High God. And he is the possessor of heaven and earth. He's not only the creator of it, he's the owner of it. And uh, he's allowing us to utilize whatever it is that we have 
but it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to him. He is the most high God. It says in Deuteronomy 10, 17, For Yahweh your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes judgment. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. This is one of my favorite verses in the, in the uh, Torah. God, he, Yahweh is your God, the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God. And that's just what he is. He's the great, the mighty, the awesome God. <laughs> he is the most high God. And then, as we see there, he executes justice. He executes justice because he is a just and righteous judge. He is a just and righteous judge. We see this very early on in the Bible. We see, you know, you all know the history of, of uh, Genesis in the beginning with Adam and Eve. Immediately God judged them, and then he judged the serpent, then he judged Cain. And then a few verses later, we see in chapter 6, is God's judgment upon the world. And then we see in chapters 14, he is judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities that are around. We look at these things and maybe we, we don't understand, but this we should understand, that God is a righteous judge. He knows what he's doing. He is always right in all of his judgments. And they're always just and right. Look at Genesis chapter 18. This is when um, Abram is pleading with God to save Sodom because he knows that his uh, nephew is living in there. He's haggling back and forth with, with Yahweh. And it says in um, 1825, Far be it from you, Abram talking to God, far be it from you to do such a thing to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And the obvious answer to that is yes, yes. And uh, he did take out the only uh, righteous one out of Lot before it was destroyed. It says in Deuteronomy 32, for I proclaim the name of the Lord. I proclaim the name of Yahweh. Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. I look at the, the scriptures and I and I, I see the different times that God has passed his judgments upon people. And I, 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 don't, I don't pretend to understand all that took place. Or, and you know, many times people will say to me, or have said to me, why does God do this? Or why does God do that? Why does God allow people to die? Why does God allow people to be sick? And, and, and so on. And, 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 and I think that's a valid question. I think with some people it's a, it's a, uh, it's a critical question where we're judging God rather than, uh, you know, wanting to really know. And I don't know the answer to all of these things. I don't know. Some of them, I, and if God explains it, then I know it. But if he doesn't explain it, I don't know it. But this I do know because he does explain this. God is perfect. And all of his ways are just. He's a God of faithfulness, and he is without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. Every decision that he has made, every decision that he will make, will be righteous, and it will be just, and it will be according to his standard. Again, I don't necessarily understand it, but you know, I don't really need to, because I'm not God nor are you. I don't need to be standing in judgment of God. I need to be 
standing in acceptance and faith of God. I know that what he does is right. And, and the more I pursue him, the more I study his scripture, the more I practice his word, the better I understand of him. But whatever I understand is always going to be incredibly limited to his reality. So I go by what his word says. He's a righteous judge. He is just. He is faithful. Uh, go back to Genesis, or go to Genesis 15. Genesis 15. This is again with Abram. And uh, God gives Abraham a, uh, a vision of the future. In Genesis 15, 13, God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. And I will also judge the nation whom they will serve and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you will be buried at a good old age. Then, in the fourth generation, they will return, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. God told Abraham what was going to happen to him in his immediate future, and he told him what was going to happen to his descendants for the next 400 years. And there's, there's so many things that are written in the Torah that helps us to understand that God knows everything that he can know, that can be known. God knows everything that can be known. Uh, you know, um, we have our men's conference at Camp Pinnacle, and uh, one of the things I always love to do when we go to Camp Pinnacle is, is you, if you walk to the very far end of the, edge of the property, you can, you can see the valley. I, what is that, Hudson Valley? or What do they call that valley? Anybody know? Well, you can see the, you can look down and you can see for miles the, you know, Albany and all that surrounds. And as you look at this, you get a, you know, a panoramic view of, of all that is out there. Well, that's God. God has that panoramic view all of the time. He knows what has passed. He knows a lot of what's going to come. He knows what's in the heart of every person. He knows, you know, he, he created humanity. He knows how we think. And, he, and, and therefore, he is the only really righteous one to make any proper judgments. That's why he says for us not to judge each other that he should be left to be the judge. He knows everything that can be known, God knows. And thereby, why he is qualified to be God and we are not. Um, the other, look at Deuteronomy chapter 20, please. The other outstanding quality of Yahweh set forth so clearly in the Torah, as well as the rest of the Bible, is that Yahweh is everywhere present. That's what his very name means to us. Yahweh is the existing one. Yahweh is the present one. Yahweh is the eternal one. If you look in the past, you'll see he was there. If you look into the future, you know that he'll be there. If you're connected with him now, you understand that he's with you wherever you go. Yahweh is present with us. A lot of times, well, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, in verse 1, him talking to Israel, when you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For Yahweh your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt, is with you. When you are approaching the battle, the priest shall come near and speak to the people. He shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, you are approaching the battle against your enemies today. Do not be faint-hearted. Do not be afraid or panic or tremble before them. 
verse 4, For Yahweh your God is the one who goes with you to fight. For you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. That where you go, he's saying to them, I will be there to support you. Look at chapter 31. Yahweh is everywhere present. That is true whether you have faith in him or don't. Whether you acknowledge his existence or don't acknowledge his existence. If you choose to be his enemy, he is still present. If you choose to be his son or his daughter and actively walking with him, he is present with you. You're never alone. In Deuteronomy 31, the question is whether or not you acknowledge that. 31.6, but strong, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. <coughs> For Yahweh your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Then Moses called to Joshua and said to him, In the sight of all of Israel, be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land which Yahweh has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall give it to them as an inheritance. And Yahweh is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Again, that constant reassurance that wherever we go, Yahweh is there with us. He is everywhere present. Of course, we know from the New Testament, well, I'll leave it till we get to the New Testament. From the Old, from the Torah, we know He is present. The other thing that stands out to me about our God is that He is holy. <laughs> Leviticus 11 Leviticus chapter 11. In, in understanding that there is so much written in, in the first five books of the Bible about our God, it was extremely difficult to decide what to talk to about this morning <laughs> because there is so much and how to show it. But just to give you some inkling of understanding... I picked what I did. In Leviticus chapter 11, in verse 44, it says, For I am Yahweh your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. And you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth. I am holy Therefore, you should be holy. Look at chapter 19. Our definition of holy or holiness may be dreadfully different from God's. All the attributes of God that make him who he is because he is holy. He, well, let me say this. Because the, the characteristics that make God who he is aren't in conflict with each other. He is who he is, and he's a holy God, and because he's a holy God, he is a just God. And because he is a just God, he's a merciful God. And because he's a merciful God, he's a righteous God. And because he's a righteous God, he's a holy God. It's his personality doesn't alter because of activity or circumstances or situations. He always is consistently who he is. Uh, I don't know if that's true about us or not, but that's true about God. That, 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 so when I, when I see an act of God, say, when, with the flood, do I, do I conclude as a result of God's judgment upon humanity at that time that he was unmerciful? No, I don't. I understand it. I filter it through what he explains to me he is. I, I look at the flood and I understand he is a God, a righteous judge, but he is also merciful and gracious and he has knowledge and he is, you know, he, I, it's in understanding and interpreting through all that he is to understand what he has done and what he will do. It, it, his action is never contradicting his personality or his characteristics that make him who he is. Do you understand what I'm saying there? 
That's an important reality. He is always holy, even if it doesn't register that way in my mind. Of course, my mind is <laughs> dirty in comparison to his holiness. So uh, in Le Leviticus 19, in verse 2, Speak to all the congregations of the sons of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for Yahweh your God is holy. And then in chapter 20, verse 7. This is said a lot in the book of Leviticus. You shall consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am Yahweh your God. Be holy, for I am Yahweh your God. See, the, the thing is, is that God isn't going to change to conform to us. We need to change to conform to Him. If we want to have a relationship with Him, He's not going to become unholy to hang out with us. We have to transform ourselves to, do, you know, to accept what Christ accomplished for us on the cross, to live a holy life in order to be in relationship with Him. Because Yahweh is holy, He requires holiness. His ways are much different from man's ways. We live in a filthy world, tarnished by the devil and sinful men. Our surroundings are so unholy, we have difficulty discerning what is holy. We debate what is acceptable in society and are pressured to uh, uh, pressured acceptance of all kinds of unclean behavior as being normal, which it isn't. I mean, it just, if you, if you look at the news today and what is, what is the headlines in the news today, what humanity is debating should so obviously be understood if we, you know, had the mind of God. I mean, people are debating whether, it, whether the, the big thing this week has been whether or not abortion is right or wrong about that there's a war going on in, in Europe somewhere, and, and whatever it is in the news, and what we're, we're fed through the filter of unholiness and filthiness. So for us to come to God, who is holy, 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 it's difficult, and we need His assistance. But the wonderful thing about our God is that He is Holy Spirit, and by the grace of God, he has given to us that which he is, which is Holy Spirit. And we can therefore become like him. But our God is holy. In Genesis 17, another thing about our God Genesis 17. Verse 1, now when Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. Well, there's another thing I could have been focused on. He's God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you. And I will multiply, multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. And you will be a father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram. It will be changed to Abraham. Verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you. And it goes on from there. I think most of us are familiar with this. I will establish my, verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. An everlasting covenant. The point I wanted to make here is that God, Yahweh, is a covenant-keeping God. When He makes a covenant, it's an everlasting covenant. He will absolutely keep His covenant. When He promises to do something, He will do it. He has impeccable integrity. He means what He says, and He says what He means, 
and he will do what he says he will do. He always has. We have a history of that, and he will in the future. He, he made a covenant to Abraham that he will fulfill. He made a covenant to David that will be fulfilled. He's made a covenant with the church today that will be fulfilled because he is a covenant-keeping God. And then in Exodus chapter 34, the last verse we'll look at this morning, the wonderful thing about Moses, who is the, the writer of most of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, is that Moses had a face-to-face -face relationship with Yahweh, and he had an unquenchable desire to know him. He wanted to know him more and more. He wasn't satisfied with just a, a little bit of an understanding. He wanted to know more which I think is vital, of vital importance to the degree that you want to know God, he will allow you to know him. If you hunger and thirst to know him, he will teach you. If your heart is open and you are receptive and you are longing and you want to know him and you read the scriptures, you apply the scriptures, you will grow in your understanding of him and axiomatically you will praise him and glorify him. To know him is to love him and to praise him. But you have to hunger for it. You have to want to know it. And, and Moses, he certainly had that. And he asked God to show him more about himself. And in Exodus 34, in verse 6, it says, Then Yahweh passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, or Yahweh, Yahweh, God, compassionate and gracious and slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sins. And yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children and the grandchildren to the third and the fourth generation. Again, so many wonderful things about our God, stated in two verses, but really illuminated throughout the Torah, illuminated throughout the rest of the Bible, illuminated in our lives if we are faithful to him. We understand him to be compassionate and gracious, slow of anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, and forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sins, and yet not leaving the guilty unpunished. So, in conclusion, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is the eternal one. He is the creator. He is all-powerful. He is the most high God. He knows all that can be known. Yahweh is just and righteous judge. Yahweh is everywhere present. Yahweh is holy. Yahweh keeps covenant. Yahweh is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, abounding in truth, forgiving and punishing the guilty. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are awed by the greatness of who you are. Please open our eyes more fully. Give us bigger hearts and bigger minds to understand you and to see you everywhere in everything. We can see, we can hear, we can taste, we can touch you because you are everywhere present. It is very obvious when our eyes are open that you are our God and that you are who you are according to your scripture. So, Father, I ask for you to help us this week as we go into it to be more and more mindful of you and to be more praiseworthy, praising of you and glorifying of you. I thank you for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.